here Pacific Standard Time. So we are going to go ahead and get started today on this live science session. Hello, everybody. My name is Amy Defoe. I'm one of the science teachers here at Graduation Alliance. And today we're going to talk about a couple different topics. We're going to look at um, cellular respiration in the biology course. And then we'll also look at some skills at looking at charts and graphs. And then um, we'll look at uh, a, an activity in the biology course as well that deals with charts and graphs it's on populations. So um, a great session we have in store for you today. A couple housekeeping items just before we get started so everybody knows here these sessions are being recorded we are being recorded right now we re-record them for a couple different reasons one is of course as we're going through this lesson and i talk about something or we share something or something comes up and you want to come back to it you'll always have that opportunity to um, view this again so you can study from it or use it, or if you need help on that particular assignment, it'll be there for you. Also, we know that um, sometimes, you know, life happens and we can't be on every one of these live sessions. So uh, we record it so that you can watch it when you do have time. Um, all your teachers are having these sessions recorded, which is great because we have this library that is growing, um, that's giving you more information about your topics and your courses and help with your activities and the lessons as well. And as you come to these courses later on, you'll have a chance to view those. So even if maybe you're not in, um, you're not to this part in biology right now, um, it might be helpful as you, when you do get to that activity, you can come back and, and see these sessions. So great little library resource that we have available um, that is growing for you as well. Okay, uh, what else? Talk about microphones. So you have the option to mute yourself, unmute yourself. Um, so if you want to share an idea, ask a question, which we love feedback, of course, in these sessions, uh, you can make sure that you're unmuted there. If for some reason you have um, some background noise or you've got to do something, there's going to be some noise, please do mute yourself because then everybody else would, would hear that and we don't want to add two distractions, okay? Also, we do have that chat option. So if you don't want to speak, um, that's great. You can type in if you have a question or if you want to respond to an answer, you can just type in there. So you'll see me check in the chat box here throughout the session as well. Um, same thing with your video. You have the option to show yourself in your screen. Hi, so nice to see everybody um, as well. Okay, so that is that for that. Thanks for joining here today. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's take a look at our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to talk about, like I said, I always break it down into pretty much like four different parts. And we try to spend about this amount of time. But of course, sometimes we have questions that come about uh, or we get through topics quicker than others. So we're going to start talking about cellular respiration. And then um, we'll have a chance where you can ask questions, get some live response, live feedback right then and there from me. And then we'll come back to another skill. And like I said, we're going to look at charts and graphs today and why they're important and how, how they help us in some different kinds as well. And then, of course, we'll end the session again with any other questions or comments um, in from this course in biology or another science course. Uh, maybe it's a topic that you're struggling with, want a little bit more information, or maybe it is a particular assignment that I can help you with. Okay, so you'll have a couple different options, chances uh, to get those questions answered. Great. Okay, so cellular respiration. A couple weeks back, I did a lesson on uh, photosynthesis, and photosynthesis and cellular respiration, they go hand in hand, and we're going to take a look at that here in a moment. Um, so when we think about respiration, I just want you to think about the words cellular respiration, two big words. Um, when I think about the first word, you can probably see in there, again, as we talk about decoding skills and how we break down vocabulary and science, you might want to look and see, are, do you see roots from other words in there? And of course, we see here the word cell. So when I think of cellular, I'm thinking, okay, it has to do with cells and it has to do with something pretty darn small, right? Okay. Uh, respiration. Lots of times when I hear that, what do you guys think of when you hear respiration? Breathing, yes, exactly. So respiration is what we say the act of respiring. And that means when we respire as humans, we are breathing, we're exhaling out, we're giving off carbon dioxide. 
Okay, so it does have to do with that. Cellular respiration is the process in which sugars, and you're probably thinking, oh, sugar, yes, okay, candy, yes. Uh, we're talking about glucose, which is a sugar that um, we get from foods that we eat, that then it can be converted into a usable energy, which we call ATP, okay? And so here in um, this little image, you can see, I know, the whole Simpson cartoon. It's a good little example. Okay, so we get sugar and oxygen. That leads to carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And that's the equation that we use when we're talking about cellular respiration. We have two products where we have sugar and oxygen. That then gets produced to, by making ADP, it, the, by, the byproducts or the products of what then comes from that is carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Okay, so you think carbon dioxide, like the gas that we give off when we breathe out, when we exhale, water, and then of course that energy is that ADP. That's the energy that our cells and our bodies can use to work, grow, function. Okay, so going back to this whole idea of photosynthesis, well, um, it starts with the producer. We think about, well, where does this energy come from? And it starts with, again, what we eat. So photosynthesis is important when it comes to cellular respiration because it starts with a producer. We need an organism that's able to produce food, okay? Just like we talked about in the last session with photosynthesis, we think about, you know, when we're hungry, we're like, or we're feeling like we need some more energy and we're hungry. We go to the fridge, grab some food and we eat it. But what we're doing is we're eating other sources of food. We're not producing it ourselves. Our bodies don't have that option to do so, but other organisms, plants do have that ability. So producers are organisms that make their own food. They're also known as what we call autotrophs. And they get their energy from chemicals and from the sun with the help of course water that converts to an energy that it's a usable in the form of a sugar or what we think of as food and the most common examples of producers are plants so when we think about well what does a plant need to grow like we talked about right there with photosynthesis you know they need sunlight and they need water and of course they need gases as well Okay, so how is it that they're able to do this? Well, plants have special structures that we do not have in our cells, and they're called chloroplasts. They're that green little teeny little organelle that you'll find in a, in a plant cell, and that's where the sun's energy is able to be absorbed, and that's where the whole process of photosynthesis takes place. So here, this is equation. So we, we're looking at two different equations, um, the photosynthesis equation, which we're just gonna go over briefly and then get more into cellular respiration here. Okay, but this is again, photosynthesis, how we're getting the sugar, how we're getting this food so that we can have energy in cellular respiration. Okay, so for photosynthesis to take, take place, we talked about what do plants need? Okay, they need carbon dioxide and they need water and they need solar energy, so they need the sunlight from the sun. That creates photosynthesis in the chloroplast of the cell. And the byproduct of what then is produced in photosynthesis is glucose and oxygen, two things we as organisms need. So that glucose has given us that energy, that's the sugar, and the oxygen, oxygen, what we breathe. Okay. In one of the, um, in the course, it goes into, okay, photosynthesis cell to cellular respiration. And then there is an, an activity in there that talks about, um, you know, how are they related? We'll look at that here. So how is it that then glucose, that energy can be used by others? So we can think in photosynthesis, we get oxygen and glucose. And there you can see a human, there's us, you know, we get to consume. Cellular respiration takes place. That energy from those producers is then used. And then the byproduct, after we use it, we get carbon dioxide, water, and of course that energy. And it makes this big old cycle here, because as you can see, plants need carbon dioxide, water, sunlight. We need oxygen and glucose. So you can see how they're all, these two processes are connected. They, we rely on each other. So producers rely on us for the carbon dioxide and the water, of course, sunlight as well. 
we rely on producers for that oxygen and that glucose. Okay, so how does this happen? Well, it starts, of course, by eating those producers. So in cellular respiration, it's the process of releasing the energy from food. So it's the process of taking that sugar from a plant and then making it into a form that our cells and our body can use. Well, where does this occur at? Because we don't just see it, right? <laughs> it occurs inside our bodies. It occurs in our cells. Um, it occurs in actually what we call the mitochondria, which is an organelle in a cell. And this is known as the powerhouse. We call it the powerhouse. Think of like an energy plant. It's a powerhouse because that's where um, the energy is created or produced or transferred. So we take that sugar, it gets transferred into a usable form that your cells can use in that powerhouse. So here's a little diagram that shows an image of a cell. And of course, you might notice this. The mitochondria kind of looks like a bean. That's how I always like to describe it. Okay, so cellular respiration takes place, the actual transformation of that sugar to an energy we can use takes place in the mitochondria of a cell inside our bodies. Okay, so what exactly is this ATP? Okay, um, when mitochondria break down that sugar, they release the energy in the form of ADP. And ADP stands for, can you say that word? It's a big one. Adesine triphosphate, and this is the energy that our cells can use from the foods that we eat. Okay, let's take a look at that equation again for cellular respiration. Okay, so here we go. So you'll notice that when we have these equations, like in photosynthesis and cellular respiration, you have this arrow. And so he, here is what we're starting with. And when you combine these together, these are the products. So everything on the other side of the arrow is what the product is from what's ever on the left side of the arrow. So here we look at, we've got oxygen. So oxygen is required for cell respiration. So again, when we breathe in, we're breathing in the oxygen. All of our cells in our body require oxygen. Okay. So cell respiration is also called aerobic respiration because aerobic you think of aerobics, there's a reason for that. A reason for that, it means with oxygen. So if you're practicing, you're engaging in aerobic activity, your body is using more oxygen. So you're breathing heavier. You might notice that when you're exercising. Glucose, there's our sugar, and that comes from photosynthesis, okay? So this is the product of photosynthesis. Glucose and oxygen are required for cell respiration, again, in the mitochondria of the cells. So you think about everything that you eat, carbs, fats, proteins, um, it all gets processed and used as a fuel. And then we have our products. So again, this is after the arrow. So these are the products of cell respiration. They include, we've got carbon dioxide. So when we breathe out, so think about it, your body's using up that oxygen and that sugar. And once it's used up, it's like you have a waste product and that waste product is carbon dioxide. We've got water, and then we get energy in the form of that ATP. Mitochondria, they do not create the energy, okay? So sometimes that is a little misconception that the mitochondria is what creates the energy. No, that's just where they, the process of releasing that sugar, the glucose that we get from producers, that's where it takes place. How are we doing so far? Okay. So again, how are photosynthesis and cellular respiration connected? So again, we think about this. Photosynthesis produces the oxygen and the glucose. So it produces two products that we need for cellular respiration to take place. The gas, oxygen, glucose, the sugar. Cellular respiration is the breakdown of the glucose into a usable form. Okay, so again, photosynthesis is what gives us that sugar and that gas, that oxygen, and then cellular respiration takes those two products and breaks it down and produces it into a form that our bodies can use. Now, again, we're talking about organisms here. We're not just talking about humans, even though I'm saying us, you know, talking about us, using us as an example. It is having, to, we're, we're talking about all organisms that breathe oxygen in, not a producer.
Okay, so here you can see in this little diagram, we get photosynthesis. Okay, so we've got carbon dioxide, we've got water, we've got light energy meets the chloroplast where that energy then is absorbed. Photosynthesis takes place. What we get, oxygen and glucose. That goes to the mitochondria of our cells and that's where chemical or the energy is that we can use and that ADP um, is created. And then of course the waste product from cellular respiration is water and carbon dioxide, which then the plants use. So again, we're talking about these products, but as you can see, it's a big old circle of cycle of this, okay? So in photosynthesis, the plants are giving off as their waste or their product, they're giving off oxygen and glucose. We use that in cellular respiration, and our products that we give off as waste products would be carbon dioxide and water. So they both rely on each other. Okay, I'm gonna take a little moment here and I'm gonna show you guys a little video clip. Cellular respiration. All living things practice cellular respiration. Power view motorization from Hunter Douglas. Sorry guys, we're gonna get a little commercial here that simplify your life. This includes bacteria, fungi, plants, and animals. But why is cellular respiration important? It is important because living organisms generate energy for daily activities with cellular respiration. In plants and animals, cellular respiration takes place at the mitochondria. Think the mitochondria as a power plant for the cell because the energy of the cell is generated at the mitochondria. Just like these power plants and turbines in this video generate power for their city. Cells that need more energy have more mitochondria, like muscles. At the mitochondria, the sugar combines with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide plus water and energy in the form of ATP. This process of cellular respiration generates energy to help keep living organisms alive. Thanks for watching. Moomoo Math uploads a new math video. Okay, so a little, uh, another example, reiterating what we had just talked about. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at that activity. Um, it's activity 5.3.1. Um, and what it's looking at is it, it's comparing cellular respiration and photosynthesis together. It's asking you how do they rely on each other. So it says carefully, and I apologize that you're seeing all this on one little screen, but um, this is coming from the directions in the activity here, okay? So it says carefully examine the diagram below that shows the relationship between two aerobic cell respiration that occurs in the mitochondria and photosynthesis that occurs in the chloroplasts of plant cells. You learn the details of photosynthesis in the previous unit. Okay? You should notice the cycling of matter, and that's the chemical compounds and the flow of energy in the diagram. So when they're talking about the cycling of matter, it's this circle that we're seeing, it's a cycle, it's continuous, okay? So we've got organic molecules and we've got oxygen, and of course that's producing carbon dioxide and water. So when we're talking about what uh, the matter is, that's, they're talking about the cycling of that matter, okay? And then of course the flow of energy. 
we know that in photosynthesis, it produces that glucose, that sugar, um, and this is where it's used, where that sugar is then transferred into ATP, which is the energy that we can use in our cells, okay? Um, both photosynthesis and cellular respiration are required to sustain life on Earth. We all need to be able to photosynthesis, have a producer that makes food, and um, cellular respiration is to break down that sugar that comes from the producer into a usable form. Okay, what they're asking you to do, here you are. You will write a two paragraph summary of how photosynthesis and cellular respiration are related. In your first paragraph, address the cycling of matter. Be specific. How does one process provide the raw materials for the other hand and vice versa? So here they're asking you to, in that first paragraph, is just to explain you know, a little summary snapshot. Snap, shat, oh, I can't say that word today. Sorry, guys. Um, a little snippet of um, what photosynthesis is and what cellular respiration is. So again, photosynthesis is a, a, the, uh, a producer being able to um, produce, fun, produce sugar that we can use. So again, when we talk about what, is, um, what the raw materials are, you wanna explain in photosynthesis that we get that glucose and we get oxygen, okay? That are, that's the byproducts of photosynthesis. And then, of course, when we talk about cell respiration, well, what, what happens there? That's the breakdown, that's the transfer of that, sh that glucose into a usable form of energy, ATP. And, of course, the byproduct of that, we also get carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so again, the first paragraph, you're just explaining what photosynthesis is, what cellular respiration is, what products are produced in each. In your second paragraph, discuss the flow of energy that takes place in an ecosystem. Be sure to discuss the initial energy source as well as the role of photosynthesis in cell respiration. Notice that respiration is not entirely efficient process and some of the energy produced is lost as heat. Um, so it says address the need for continual energy input into the ecosystem and into the ecosystem. This is not just a cycle. So we think about it. If we removed that sun, photosynthesis and cell respiration would not be able to take place. Okay, so that's that continual energy source right there. In that second paragraph, you're welcome to, you could use an example. Um, you can write the paragraph just in more of a scientific form of answering and of describing it, or you could you know, give an example and you could use maybe a tree. Um, you could talk about um, a hemlock tree in an ecosystem and how it's using that sun and the water and carbon dioxide and producing um, organic molecules that sugar and oxygen through photosynthesis. And then you could talk about um, maybe a deer comes by and eats you know, the grass down underneath that tree. And it's talking about the cycling of that matter, how they're interconnected. Let me show you. So again, we look at this bigger picture just so that you can see because I know it's kind of hard to see on that little slide there that we saw. So again, of course, we have to have this continual energy source and that's the sun. The sunlight provides light energy that of course a producer can use uh, a plant. So you think about it, here's our chloroplast. Remember those are structures inside the cells that allows the absorption of that light energy to occur. When that happens, of course, we've got carbon dioxide and water, sunlight, it produces glucose and oxygen. Other organisms then in their mitochondria can take that, glu that glucose, that oxygen, um, and it is transferred into ADP, which gives us the energy that our bodies can use. You think about that it does give us some heat energy because of course you're transferring the energy, you're gonna get some um, production of heat there too and it produces carbon dioxide and water that then continues the cycle around here that the producers can then use. We rely on each other, interaction of, of organisms here. Okay, so here is an example. Um, this is from a student. They wrote, for their first paragraph, they wrote, as in the diagram above, photosynthesis uses light, carbon dioxide and water to produce glucose and oxygen. So again, they just explained what, what the products of photosynthesis are. 
During cellular respiration, glucose and oxygen produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy, ADP. And there's the products of cellular respiration. So to summarize, cellular respiration releases carbon dioxide into the air, photosynthesis then pulls that carbon dioxide from the air. It's a cycle that just keeps repeating itself over and over again. So we get that production of that sugar, we get oxygen, cellular respiration, we get the transfer of that glucose into a usable form, ATP, and carbon dioxide. Okay, second paragraph describing how this works in an ecosystem. It says organisms are put into two categories, autotrophs and heterotroph heterotrophs. Plants, algae, and some bacteria are in the autotroph category because they can produce their own food. They're really called photoautotrophs because they use the sun's energy. So there's our light source, our energy source. The light to produce their food. The rest of the organisms are heterotrophs, including animals. They do not use the sun for their food. They eat the organisms for fuel. Producers are the autotrophs. They begin the food chain. Heterotrophs consume the autotrophs, plants. They're called the consumer. So since autotrophs use the sun to, into the chemical energy for, in food, it's not a cycle, it's the food chain. The food chain or flow of energy starts with the producer. They are consumed. They receive energy from digesting the plants, breaking it down into ADP. The energy then transfers into body heat, which then can get gloss. So you have to eat more frequently to keep warm. And our bodies are always continuously using energy. And it goes from herbivores to carnivores. So they're giving an example of kind of a food chain in an ecosystem. It just continues until finally, the last of the chain, the decomposers break down and puts nutrients back into the soil. Okay, so again, here they explained how this works in an ecosystem, explaining how we have those producers that are able to produce their own, produce food through photosynthesis, which then gives other organisms, the consumers, that ADP, that, uh, that we can create that ADP from the transfer of energy of that glucose and oxygen that we get from the plants. Okay, so hopefully that gives a little bit more clear um, understanding as to what this diagram is showing and what you are supposed to do. So again, in that first paragraph, they want you to explain uh, photosynthesis, cellular respiration, what the products are. Okay. Second paragraph, they want you to explain the flow of energy in an ecosystem. So how that might look from photosynthesis from a producer to uh, cellular respiration from a consumer and then the cycling of matter. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions? It could be about what we've just talked about with cellular respiration or any other questions that you might have from your courses, other classes. Always in these live sessions, you have the option. You can get a quick answer right here um, live. So anytime that you're maybe struggling with something, you can take a look at in the schedule and see, okay, when can I get that question answered? If you don't have any right now, we will totally come back here um, before we end the session and you'll have another opportunity to uh, ask questions that come to mind. Maybe I just need a moment to think. Okay, then let's go ahead and take a look at um, a skill. And we're going to look at analyzing data. So we're going to look at why it is that we have all of these charts and graphs, data tables. What do they do for us? How are they helpful? Um, you'll see in some of the assignments and activities in science, but also in other courses, uh, you'll see the use of these charts and tables as well. So why do we, or we could say, you know, and scientists, because they do a lot of data collection, and their experiments. Why do we use tables and charts? Why do we use all these different types of graphs and data collection tools? Well, of course, the reason is it helps us kind of um, decipher or figure out what this data is showing us or telling us. So it gives us a better visual. So here in this example, we're looking at you know, we can compare different variables, what we're, what we're um, looking at. So here in this case, we're looking at study time versus grades. 
And so here we have a bunch of students and it looks at the amount of time they are studying and then what their grade is to of course see if there's some type of correlation between the two. So uh, is there a relationship between study time and grade? So again, it's a visual a representation of our data. Instead of just seeing a bunch of numbers listed out or sentences explaining, it gives us a visual of it so that we can see it visually, get a better understanding. Okay, so charts and graphs, they provide a visual representation of our results. By organizing data, a scientist, a student, a teacher, people, we can more easily interpret it what has been observed. So making sense of data is what we call interpretation. So by organizing our data, it gives us the opportunity to have a better understanding, more easier way to interpret what was collected and observed in that study. Since most of the data scientists collect is quantitative, meaning numbers, data tables and charts are usually used to organize the information. Graphs are also created by data, from data tables. They allow the investigator to get a visual image of the observations, which simplifies interpretation and drawing conclusions. Valid conclusions depend on organization and clear interpretation of that data. So when we look at our observations, using that visual image gives us a simpler way to interpret it. And then from there, we can draw conclusions. And conclusions is like a way of answering the question, but of course it's based on that data. So let's look at a couple different examples, different types of charts and graphs that we can use. So you'll see this one, this is an example of a bar graph. In a bar graph, it shows the relationship between items. So in this particular example, they're looking at school attendance and science grades. So we've got students listed here at the bottom, and then it looks at percentage, of course, their grades. And their day, uh, percentage, school attendance, and of course, their grades. Okay, so you can see you're looking at uh, the stripe line showing a school attendance, the dark blue solid line, that's representing their science grades. So we're looking at, is there a relationship between being at school, school attendance, and science grade? So we get a visual showing us, in this case, okay, so showing the relationship between items. A pie chart, you know, I think about it, it shows distribution, so you think about it, wonder why it's called a pie chart. We have a big circle here, you can think about it, we've all seen what a pie looks like. Now think about cutting that pie in slices. So we use this to show a distribution. So in this case, we're looking at favorite pizza topping. Um, and you can see, you know, 50% gives us that visual of how much that is compared to other ones. We use a pie chart when um, in the water cycle in the unit that talks about the water cycle and uh, looking at, you know, how much of the earth is composed of water and the breakup of that water, fresh water to salt water. A line graph, it helps to show trends. So showing here, we're looking at average snowfall between two different cities over time. So again, it gives us that visual representation of lots of snow there in New York in January, and then you can see it drops off for both of them. And then it goes back up. So it's showing trends over time. Data table show differences. So here we're looking at plant growth in soils with different pH. So we've got seven different plants. We're looking at the pH of the soil and then looking to see how that affects their height. And you can see right there, you'll notice that you've got lower numbers, lower numbers at the low range of pH and the high range of pH. But right there, it looks like there's a sweet spot that those plants like based off of the numbers that we get. Okay, so in bio and biology semester one, six, four, one, um, there is a activity called populations. And in this activity, they're looking at a data table of a population of um, deers and, and wolves. Sorry, I popped right out of that. Let me 
I'm going to actually pull it up here. Sorry, it's loading, it's loading, it's loading. Okay, there, now you guys should be able to see it. Okay, so in this activity, we are going to review what we just learned about, about factors that are affecting the population. So, um, it says, here's a little introduction. So it gives us a little past little blurb here. In 1970, the deer population of an island forest reserve, about 518 square kilometers in size, was about 2,000 animals. Although the island had excellent vegetation for feeding, the food supply obviously had limits. Only had so much food to supply enough organisms. Thus, the forest management personnel feared that overgrazing might lead to mass starvation. So if we had more organisms, that would lead to um, starvation because there wouldn't be enough food for all of those organisms. Since the area was too remote for hunters, the Wildlife Service decided to bring in a natural predator to control the deer population. It was hoped that the natural predation would keep the deer population from becoming too large and also increase the deer quality or the health, as predators often eliminate the weaker members of that herd. In 1971, 10 wolves were flown into the island. And here is what was observed based off of that. So we have here a year, looking at a study of 10 years, here, the wolf population. So again, they brought in 10. The original starting population of the deer was 2,000. And then of course we can see offspring, um, how many were preyed upon, and then how many starved. Okay, so here if we look in this first column, we can look at the population of the wolves. What do you notice? Over 10 years, start with 10, it goes up, and then it looks like there's just hit the spot of when there was just too many. So probably the wolves were then um, vying for food as well. And then the population decreased down to this is probably going to be what that population could withstand, how much food could be produced for those wolves. Here's our deer population. And you can see it goes up and then it drops back down and it comes to this nice kind of consistent number over the last three years. From this, we could say, okay, it looks like this is what the population in that uh, little ecosystem could hold to keep that many deers alive, provide enough food for them. So it says, describe what happened to the deer and wolf populations between 1971 and 1980. So if we look at that, we can see that the wolf population started off at 10, it got up pretty high, and then it started to drop down to an even number. Same with the deer population, started off at 2000 and increased. And then of course, as we think about these wolves coming in, then it lowered down to a number that that ecosystem could withstand, be able to supply enough food for. So in both cases, the numbers went up and then of course they went down until they got to a nice kind of equilibrium. Why do you, what, do you, what do you think would have happened to the deer on the island had the wolves not been introduced? So if those bulls did not come, what would happen to that number? As we read in that introduction, we know that uh, starvation would have occurred. And of course, also we could think about the health of those organisms as well. So we could have, um, um, the population of the deer that 
they would begin to have starvation issues. You could also think about health issues, famine, disease could come into play here as well. Okay. So then it goes to this one question where it's kind of asking you to extend your thoughts here. Most biology textbooks describe that predators and prey exist in balance. So it's the balance of nature. Um, opponents of this hypothesis propose the following though. Why is death by predators more natural or right than death by starvation? So thinking about, was it right to bring in this population of wolves to help control the deer population? How does one determine when an ecosystem is in balance? Do predators really kill only the old and sick prey? What evidence is there for this statement? And then finally, so they're giving you some questions about what others might think. What is your opinion of the balance of nature hypothesis? So do you think, would the deer on the island be better off, worse off, or about the same without the wolves? Defend your position. So they're asking you to say, should the, the wolves been brought in? Why or why not? And of course, that is going to be uh, a personal question for you. So as you think about, you know, is it a good thing to bring the wolves in and help balance and create that balanced equilibrium in that population so that, um, you know, both, both organisms are surviving, living, balancing each other off, or would it have been better to leave the deer alone and let kind of nature decide uh, which deers, how many deers are going to survive and which ones. Or do you think about, you know, are we making it worse for those deers if we did nothing? Because then of course there could be um, sick deers come into play. Do you think about not having food? The health of the deer is gonna decrease and then you've got, you could get more diseases, famine that occurs. Okay. Let me switch screens here. So let me show you a couple examples here. So in this one, the student, when we think about, describe, what does this table show us? Describe the deer and wolf populations. So it says between the years 1971 and 1980, the deer and wolf populations first raised, then met a peak, and then it was dropped. This is mostly due to the rise in predation. So those wolves being introduced. During 1973-75 were the peak years. So here, of course, we see that because we've got the highest numbers. And then afterwards, um, it dropped down. What do you think would have happened to the deer on the island had the wolves not been introduced? And the student wrote, I think it would become overpopulated considering when peak numbers were high for the deer, so were the wolves. And then everything went down for both species. So I'm believing that the numbers were going to increase. The last question, what is your opinion of the balance of nature hypothesis? Would the deer on the island be better off, worse off, or about the same? Defend your position. The student wrote, I believe in the balance of nature hypothesis because it's just facts. Without an equal amount, there would be more deaths by different ways, such as starvation. It's a circle of life. Ecosystems can be determined when the rate of deaths and births stay about the same each year. Predators kill whoever they can get a food source, and that's the way of life will continue to work until we die, just like cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Okay. So again, they said that they, they explained that they believe in it, and then they gave their reasons why. Here's another example. Uh, the student wrote the deer population decreased from the wolf's population. Um, it took out the weak deer and the starvation went down. What is your opinion? The balance of nature, uh, sorry, these are out of order. What do you think would have happened to the deer on the island if the wolves had not been introduced? I think if the wolves were not introduced in the ecosystem, the population of deer would have been way too populated and there wouldn't be enough food for the deer and they could starve. Uh, what's your opinion about the balance of nature hypothesis? I believe that it's a good thing that they brought the wolf population to bring down the deer population so that there isn't any starvation for the deer population. And the wolves brought down the weak deer and helped out the population in the ecosystem so there weren't too much deer in the population. So I like this student make that point about taking down the weak deer. So we think about survival of the fittest. Um, 
the wolves are going to prey upon the weaker deers, the ones that can't hide, can't run as fast. And then, of course, as those uh, deers that are healthier, let's say better suited to that environment, they're going to then reproduce and pass on those genes. Another example. So again, the student talked about um, the population increased and then of course it decreased um, until it was sustainable. It's a great word, sustainable for that population. What do you think would have happened if the deer, to the deer if the wolves were not introduced? Famine and disease would have ran rampant in the deer population. What's your opinion on the balance? Of nature. The student wrote it's very important because without it certain species can overpopulate if there are no predators. So the deer would be worse off because they would starve from a lack of food and disease would spread much easier than through the weaker deer. Okay so in this activity what they're asking you to do and what students are doing is they're looking at this data. They're looking at the population over a period of time. They're looking at what happens to the population of deer when wolves are brought in. And then from that, we can base our opinions on the, um, we think about the um, nature of, the, uh, sorry, the balance of nature hypothesis. Okay, so interpreting that data. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so today we talked about um, cellular respiration, and then we looked at how photosynthesis and cellular respiration are connected, rely on each other. And then we also looked at using charts and graphs in science and also in other areas. And then we looked at uh, that assignment on populations. Okay, so before, is there any other questions maybe about what we've talked about or questions about other topics? Other questions you would like to have answered? Okay, so again, these with these live sessions, um, again, if you have ideas about topics that you would like to be covered, certain, maybe a unit or an assignment, please send me an email or send me a chat. I would love to do, um, a live session that um, would help you out, give you more information, help you succeed better in these courses. Okay, so I would love to get input from students about what would be helpful for you um, to have a live session on. In the meantime, um, if you have questions, please do email your teachers. If um, I'm your teacher, send me a chat, email, whatever it may be. If I'm not, um, send your teacher a chat, email. They will answer your questions too. Okay, so until then, I hope this was informative to you, and thanks for joining, and we will see you again next time. Have a great day.